Brad, for the opportunity to be with you this evening. Um, I mentioned this morning at Flushing that I think spring is finally here. We have signs everywhere that it has finally arrived. The temperatures are going up. The trees have budded. They have started to have leaves on them. Um, saw a motorcyclist out on the road today and orange barrels are popping up everywhere, which is a sure indication in Michigan that spring is here. I was going from Flushing back down to Heartland this afternoon and I didn't want to get on 23 because that's got a lane closure. I was on Linden Road. I got on Linden Road at a certain point and said, that's closing. You got to take this detour. I took that detour over to Torrey Road. I was on Torrey Road and it said, Torrey Road is closed. You're going to have to take this detour. And so it's just like crazy. You'll see more of the countryside that way. Um, but it does get a little crazy in, in Michigan in the spring and summertime. We appreciate you all being here tonight. Um, the other thing about spring is it seems everybody's attitude starts getting better. As things warm up, as the sun comes out, everybody seems to be getting into a, a better mood. But unfortunately, as in many things in life, and in this country in particular lately, there seems to be debates and arguments about everything, especially around political themes, political ideas. And one of the debates and arguments that has been going on probably for a couple of years now is how we view the history of this country. How do we look at the history of what has occurred in this country from the time of its inception, even until now? And with most arguments of this type, there are two extremes that are very vocal in this argument. And one of those extremes looks at this country and says it was based on genocide, that it started in bloodshed, that the principles that founded this country are flawed, and because of those flaws, that the country has committed atrocity after atrocity after atrocity throughout its history. And that there is nothing good about this country, and all we can do is just burn it to the ground and try something new. The other extreme looks at this country, and they see the founding principles, and they think that they are perfect just the way they are. And they think that everything that this country has done over the last 250 so years has been good. And they see no flaws with anything and they want to keep everything exactly the same going forward. There is another group that I hope is the majority, they're just not quite as vocal, that's somewhere in the middle of this, that looks at the principles of this country and appreciates the way that this country was founded. The principle that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That the founding principles of this country state that men and citizens really are responsible for themselves. And that government is answerable to the people, not people to the government. That too much power in the hands of too few people can lead to corruption. And these types of principles. But we can also look at this country and recognize the fact that this country has not always lived up to the principles that it was based on that it has not always done the best things for its citizens or for those in the world around us. And we can see that there are mistakes that have been made. We can look at those mistakes and we can try to learn from those mistakes and try to do better as we go forward. Now, I do not want this to be a political sermon. It is not my intention for this to be a political sermon. And I hopefully will not hear a bunch of people talking about how to look at the history of this country afterwards. But just as we can see different ways to look at the history of this country, we also as individuals can look at our own lives from different perspectives. And we can look at them in different ways, and the way we look at our past lives can have a great bearing on how we go forward in our lives into the future. So I want to look tonight at how we look at our lives. How do we look at our past? How do we look at what we have done up till now and then going forward? We can look at our lives and see our past, and see the mistakes that we have made. We can see the sins that we have in our life. We can see the pain that we may have caused others. And we can throw our hands up in despair. And all we see is the bad that we have done in our lives. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27. I'm going to lower this slightly. Sorry, Cody. <laughs> Matthew chapter 27. Judas was one who had this problem as he looked back on his life. And we know the story that Judas, for 30 shekels of silver, betrayed Jesus and turned him over to the Pharisees. In Matthew 27, beginning in verse 1, we read that when morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus to put him to death. 
And they bound him and led him away and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. And then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and elder, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? You shall see to it yourself. And he threw the pieces of silver into the temple sanctuary and left, and he went away, and he hanged himself. See, Judas looked at what he had done in this one particular case. We know in other writings that Judas committed some other sins while he was following Jesus. But he looked at his life, and he saw nothing that could redeem him. He saw nothing that could change what he had done in the past. And because of that, he had total despair, no hope, and he went out and killed himself. He could not see any way to have his sin forgiven. Even Peter was someone that at the beginning had this same problem when he looked at his own life. If you turn to Luke chapter 5, Luke chapter 5, we have there an incident that occurs early on, one of the early incidents between Peter and Jesus when he was first meeting Jesus. And Jesus has borrowed Peter's boat and stood in it while he preached to the crowds out on the shore. And we begin in verse 4, that when he, talking about Jesus, had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon responded and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. And when they had done this, they caught a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to tear. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats to the point that they were sinking. But when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Peter recognized that his life had not been what it needed to be up until this point. And his first response, when he was presented with Jesus being someone from God, obviously, was to say, depart from me. He could not look at his life and expect that Jesus would accept him the way that he was. Fortunately, Peter did not do what Judas did, but he also had problems when he looked back at his life, recognizing the fact that he had oftentimes sinned and not done according to God's will. There are many people who look at their lives in despair because of what they have done in the past. They think about the mistakes that they have made, but there is hope no matter how far we think we have fallen. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 6, beginning in verse 9. Paul writes there and says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor those habitually drunk, nor verbal abusers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Sounds pretty dismal at this point. Many people find themselves in these situations, but notice how Paul continues. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. I think it's important for us to go back to this verse from time to time. Help us to remember maybe where we came from. To remember some of the past mistakes, but also to see what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. Notice what Paul says, you have been washed. As you've been cleaned, the dirt has been washed away. You are clean once again. You have been sanctified, declared holy, declared free from sin. And you have been justified, proven to be right, declared righteous in the name of Jesus Christ. See, it doesn't matter how many sins you've had in your life. When you look back at your life and you see all those mistakes, you can also look to see what Jesus has done for you. You can look and see what he offers to you. If you have not yet accepted him, you can see what he offers, regardless of how far you think that you have fallen. Some people look at their lives and they despair because of what they see and the mistakes that they have made. But some people also look back at their lives and think they're fine just the way they are. They look at what they've accomplished. They look at the things they've been able to do. They look at maybe the good things they have done in their lives. And they ignore and, and gloss over any mistakes they may have made. We see the Pharisees often in this light. In Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 9, Jesus has a parable to people who view themselves in this way. That they are just fine the way they are. Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 9. <clears throat> Verse 
Now, Jesus also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and began praying this in regard to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, crooked, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. Of course, most of us are familiar with the rest of that parable that the tax collector humbly bowed to God, and Jesus said it was the tax collector that was justified not the Pharisee. But notice the attitude of this Pharisee. He looked at what he accomplished in his life for God, supposedly for God, and he almost was telling God, aren't you glad I'm on your team? Aren't you glad I'm on your side and I'm, I'm working for you? The problem with many of the Pharisees was that they looked at all their good deeds and failed to see where they had gone wrong and where they had sinned. Some of the most scathing rebukes that Jesus has for people when he was in this world was toward the Pharisees. Matthew chapter 23 is where we read a number of those, and we'll go there and read a few of those now. Matthew chapter 23. But one of the problems with the Pharisees was that they looked at their good deeds that unfortunately were only skin deep and thought that that made them right with God and they needed no additional help. <clears throat> Matthew 23, verses, beginning in verse 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish, so that the outside of it may also become clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside... They are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to people, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Again, those actions that they performed were only skin deep. They never allowed God to penetrate into their hearts. Think for a minute of both of those descriptions that Jesus gives of them. Imagine, if you will, cooking dinner tonight. And after you're done, you've got some leftovers in there. Maybe you burned it a little so it's stuck on pretty good. You make sure the outside is very nice and clean, but you leave what's in the middle there. When you take that out to cook again tomorrow, how are you going to feel when you see what's there? Or you let it sit for a few days, what's it going to be like? As the Pharisees inside, and we know also the tombs, the great marble um, mausoleums to those who had died previously, and yet inside full of dust, dirt, and dead men's bones. They looked at their good deeds and forgot that they had also sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. James tells us in James 2.10 that when we break one command, we're guilty of breaking it all. So once we sin one time, once we make one mistake, we are then lost. We are then separated from God. And it doesn't matter how many good deeds we do, we can't make up for that sin doesn't matter how hard we work for God, we can't make up for that sin. We need to recognize that we can't get to heaven on our own. No matter how many good things we do, we cannot erase the sins we have in our lives. And as Romans 6.23 tells us, the wages of sin is death. And so we can't look at our past lives and gloss over the mistakes that we've made. So what's the answer? How do we look at it? We can't look at all our past mistakes and throw our hands up in despair because God says, I've got a way for you. And we also want to make sure that we don't gloss over what we've done in the past. So what we need to do is look at our past, learn from our mistakes, and strive to get better each and every day. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul is a great example of this type of individual. One that could look at his past lives, both look at his mistakes as well as look at his accomplishments and understand what they accomplished for him or didn't accomplish for him. First Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. Paul writes there and says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service, even though I was previously a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. Yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance 
that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost. Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost sinner, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Paul did not shy away from the mistakes and the sins of his past. He was very honest and upfront with what he had done in the past. And yet he showed that that actually drove him harder to serve God even more. But not only did he not shy away from his sins, but he also did not rely on his accomplishments. Turn over to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 2. Philippians 3, beginning in verse 2. Paul writes there and says, Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God and take pride in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself could boast at having confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he is confident in the flesh, I have more reason. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, the persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. For whatever things were gained to me, these things I have counted as loss because of Christ. Notice again, Paul did not take any credence in what he had accomplished in the past. He didn't look at his past accomplishments in the flesh and say, because of this, God wants me. Because of this, I'm a most valuable player for God. Brother, he said, these things I count as loss. These mean nothing in light of Christ Jesus. Keep your fingers in Philippians 3. We're going to come back to that in a moment. But turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Even after Paul was a Christian, he did not rely on the work that he accomplished as an apostle of Christ, even though he had many accomplishments as an apostle. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, the church in Corinth had a problem with Paul. They didn't see Paul as anything special. And Paul had oftentimes had to defend his apostleship to the Corinthian church. And oftentimes the Corinthians would accept others who seemed to be more highly credentialed uh, than Paul was. Today we would think, okay, you know, you got those PhDs, you must be smarter um, than, than the local preacher kind of thing. But uh, Paul sometimes had to defend himself to the Corinthian church. And this is one such case where he has to do that. So you need to understand when he does talk about these accomplishments he has had, we understand the reason why he is saying these things. So beginning in the latter part of verse 21, he says, In whatever respect anyone else is bold, I am speaking in foolishness, I too am bold. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am speaking as if insane, I more so. In far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent adrift at sea. I have been on frequent journeys, in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers among false brothers. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is a daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? Who is led without, into sin without my intense concern? And now he comes back to why he was saying all of this, right? It does sound like Paul is boasting, but he gave the reason was because they weren't accepting of him. But notice what he says in verse 30. If I have to boast, I will boast of what pertains to my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, he who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. Paul recognized that, yes, he had done all these things. Yes, he had gone through all these persecutions to serve Jesus, but he also recognized this was not where his salvation lied. It was not his accomplishments that made him worthy of salvation, but rather it was the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Throughout Paul's writings, 
If you go through his writings from beginning to end, you will see that Paul oftentimes shows both sides of this. It doesn't matter how bad you are, God can save you. It also doesn't matter how good you are, you can't be saved on your own. And he proves that time and time again, even in his own life. It doesn't matter how much you do for Jesus. All that matters is Jesus himself. He is the one that wipes away your sins, no matter how bad they are. And your accomplishments are meaningless because they cannot save you on their own accord. It is all through the blood of Jesus Christ. Look back to Philippians chapter 3. We'll continue there where we left off. In Philippians 3, beginning in verse 7, we read, Whatever things were gained to me, these things I have counted as lost because of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them mere rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if somehow I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And notice these next words and remember who is writing them. This is the Apostle Paul. This is the one that established how many churches across the known world at the time. This is someone who is sitting in prison at this very time because of his faith in Christ Jesus. And notice what he writes. He says, Not that I have already grasped it all, or have already become perfect, but I press on, if I also take hold of that for which I was even taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not regard myself as having taken hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, Reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul, even as he was coming to the end of his life, recognized that he still had work to do simply because of the love and the grace and the mercy that God had shown to him. But he also recognized that it all came because of Jesus Christ. Paul did not dwell on his past mistakes. He remembered them. In his own words, they drove him to work even harder because he recognized how far he had strayed away from God. But he also did not dwell on his accomplishments. He did not rely on those things that he saw in his life that he had done good in, but rather he recognized that it all came from the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The Bible is full of examples of people who failed and yet turned around and became great examples for us. If you look at Abraham, Abraham lied at least twice that we know of. Abraham got impatient with God keeping his promise for him, so he felt like he needed to help God out a little bit. That didn't turn out so well. But Abraham eventually became the great father of faith. Moses killed a man, went into exile for 40 years, and when God came to him, he gave excuse after excuse on why he wasn't the right person for God to choose. And yet God chose him anyway. And he became the great lawgiver. And later in his life, as Moses is leading those people through what they had to go through, the great signs that he performed, the great miracles that he did, speaking face to face with God, even in that situation we read that Moses was the most humble man alive. He recognized that what he had came from God. David committed adultery, committed murder, and yet was called a man after God's own heart. Peter, as we looked at before, not only did he declare himself as a sinner in God's presence, but he also denied Jesus three times. And yet he then turned around and became one of the leaders in the Jerusalem church and later faced death because he would not deny Jesus. And the Apostle Paul, as we've already looked at, who was a persecutor of the church, a blasphemer, one who tried and sent people to death because of their faith in Christ Jesus, became one of its greatest missionaries. You can look at your life in three different ways. You can look back at your life and dwell on your past sins, despair, because you can see only evil in your life. But when you do that, you will fail to see the wonderful grace that is offered by God through Jesus Christ and his blood. You will not be able to see that God is ready to wash you 
to sanctify you, to justify you in the name of Jesus Christ. You can look back at your life and dwell on your accomplishments. You can become self-righteous and have an attitude of contempt toward other people because you don't think they're doing enough for God. Maybe they're not doing as much as you are. Maybe they aren't trying as hard, or in your mind, they are not. You can become prideful in your actions, failing to understand and remember that your accomplishments cannot wash your sins away. It is only through the blood of Jesus that you can be saved. Or you can look at your past. You can acknowledge your past mistakes, recognizing that they have been washed away by God, corrected by him. You can use them as lessons to be better in the future, and you can rejoice in what God has accomplished through your work and activities in his name. But always recognizing that no matter how hard you work, you can't earn salvation. It is only through the blood of Jesus Christ. No matter how hard you work, you can't repay God's grace. No matter how hard you work, you cannot repay what Jesus has done for you. Forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We can learn from our past. We can see where we failed, and we can see when we succeeded. And we can use those examples to help us to be better each and every day into the future. We need to not dwell too much on the past. We don't want to wallow in our despair, and we don't want to become prideful in what we've accomplished, but rather we use those as lessons, and we always look forward to the goal of the upward call of Christ Jesus. If we can help you in any way tonight, if you need to start your journey with God, if you need to turn your life over to him, if you see only despair in your past, God offers hope. And we can give you and help you toward that hope, being buried in baptism, accepting Jesus as your Savior, coming in contact with his blood through that baptism. If you are walking with God at this time, and you look back at your life and you still feel you're falling short, we can encourage you, we can help you. God is always ready to forgive you. All you need to do is ask for his forgiveness. If we can help you in any way tonight, as you come forward as we stand and sing.